This is Airing Pain, a programme brought to you by Pain Concern, the UK charity providing information and support for those of us living with pain, our family and supporters, and the health professionals who care for us. Dyma Airing Pain, rhaglen a gyflwyn ydy chi gan Pain Concern, a relisyn yn y deyrnas i nedig sy'n darparu gwybodaeth a chefnogaeth i rhai ohonym sy'n byw gyda ffoen a'n tael i ancefnogwyr ar iechyd gweithwyr proffesiynol sy'n gofalu amdanom. Anyway, yw Paul Evans. I'm Paul Evans. Mae diwch yn fawr iawn chi a diwch am y gwahoddiad i siarad gyda chi yn y gynhadledd gyntaf sy'n ymwneud â poen parhaus yng Nghymru. So thanks very much for the invitation to come and speak to you this afternoon. I think this is the first persistent pain conference for Wales, and I'm really delighted to see such uh, a varied representation of healthcare professionals uh, here today. Uh, And I'm happy to have this opportunity to share with you some key updates in relation to persistent pain in Wales. That's the Wales Minister for Health and Social Services, Elinid Morgan, who on September the 18th, that's 2023, launched the revised Living Well with Persistent Pain in Wales guidelines. She addressed over 170 delegates, mostly health professionals, but some patient representatives, including those of us from Pain Concern, and some service providers. The full document is available to view online. You'll find the links on Pain Concern's website. But throughout the day, I was able to eavesdrop on some of the conversations going on in workshops and talk to some of the service providers. September marks Pain Awareness Month and today represents a valuable opportunity to raise awareness of an often unrecognised aspect of pain, which is, of course, persistent and chronic pain. And what we know is that this condition affects a significant proportion of our population. I think that's estimated between 33 and 50% of the population suffer with some form of persistent pain. And that's uh, up to 1.3 million adults just in Wales. So we are talking about a lot of people here. And these are conditions that can have a major impact on a person's quality of life, their ability to work, to function, as well as clearly their mental well-being. But we know that with the right information and support collectively, we can develop pain services in a way that produces better outcomes and experiences for these individuals. And that's why the Welsh Government has been working closely with our partners in the health service, academia and those with lived experience to refresh the Living with Persistent Pain Guidance. I'm Owen Hughes. I'm the National Clinical Lead for Persistent Pain in in Wales. It's a refreshed guidance. What has happened between 2019 and 2023 that might need refreshing? Well, I think it is the obvious thing. It is the fact that COVID has made a massive difference to the way that we run deliver services in Wales. It's made a massive difference to the way people live their lives. And so our role with, in terms of refreshing that is to acknowledge the fact that uh, now people are using digital much more as a way of engaging with, with uh, the healthcare services and also the fact that levels of digital literacy have also changed massively by having to use Teams, Zoom and whatever to keep contact with people over COVID. It almost seems as if you would have had to tear out pages 45 to 90 of the previous ones and replace them with something else. Well, the key elements are there. The key sort of ideas are very much the, the, the same. But what has changed is the opportunity for digital and, and for the things. At the end of the day, the document is about actually helping people to work with their healthcare professionals and that's really what we want to be doing with it is saying that pain management is not something that healthcare professionals do to people or do to patients it is something that people do alongside the healthcare professionals working as a team and very much working on whatever it is the individual themselves whether that's be staying in work spending time with their grandchildren whatever that's the core of this how have patients been involved in the writing of this new document What we've done is had various focus groups as part of the thing. People have been invited to review the document in its various iterations over the years. What we want to do going forward now is is to really involve people in the development of the services as we go forward. So we've in the process of setting up a people's panel for persistent pain where we want to 
hear the voices of all sorts of different people who are affected by uh, living with persistent pain, both the people themselves, but also their carers, families, employers, communities. There isn't just one person, one sort of person who lives with persistent pain. There are people living in care homes who have persistent pain. There are people living in their own homes. There are people who are, you know, carrying on their normal lives and who aren't, who have come, never come in contact with the health services. So we want to hear from them as well and understand what is it that actually helps them and protects them from having to come and see healthcare professionals. How can they get their voice heard? We're always very, very pleased to hear from anybody who's got a story to tell or questions they want to want answered. So they can come direct to us, myself or Sue Jeff, who's the other national clinical lead. The health minister is always interested in hearing from people who are living with um, various different concerns and the services and how they both positive and negative stories about what's working. And actually, that will always help us to keep the profile of pain high in Wales as well. Now, this was first published in 2019, and we've received. Positive feedback, I think, is fair to say, on its use as a source that empowers individuals to better understand their condition and to become a more active partner in their own care and as a tool to aid health boards to plan their persistent pain services appropriately. Now, it's important that this guidance continues to evolve as we gain more understanding of what works and where there's scope for improvement, based not just on evidence, but on talking to people about their actual needs. We are RCS, Real City Strategy, based up in North Wales, and we're running a project called the Inwork Support Services, and we're running it across North Wales, West Wales, and Swansea Bay and Neath Port Talbot area. So what do RCS do? So RCS are a community interest company um, who support wellbeing. So we're currently running the in-work support service, but we do also provide wellbeing training and support to small, medium enterprises um, and other businesses as well. And what sort of support is that? So basically, with our clients, what we do with the in-work support service is we're supporting clients who could potentially go off work through physical or mental health issues so they're at risk of being in sickness absence from work or struggling at work so basically living well with persistence pain is part of what we're trying to help clients do we work with clients with a range of different issues but obviously a lot of clients do present with pain and we've recently been supporting clients with lymphedemia so there are an array of conditions that clients present with we provide them counseling or access to physiotherapy or occupational therapy to help them manage their conditions and help them to stay in work. How do they get in touch with you? So it's self-referral. Anybody who's employed or self-employed over the age of 16 and the way that they can sort of get in touch with our service is via our website rcswales.co.uk they can email or they can phone in to the company. We know that since 2019, a huge amount has changed. COVID has led to significant developments in how our NHS services are developed and used, including how we can develop and take full advantage of digital technologies to improve access and outcomes for the people that require care. And it was great to see recently an example um, in Hoalvar House Board, watching people prepare for surgery all done remotely and the feedback from the patients was that this is really really working for them Uh, it's preparing them for operations it did reduce their pain it was all of these things so this ability now for us to use this remote access I think is absolutely transformative. NW Gethin Harris doing great for well consultant physiotherapist and Bronchis and Powis ever team uh, the Powys Living Well Service. Let me brush up on my Welsh. You're a physiotherapist working with the Powys Health Board in... Uh, in the Powys Living Well Service. And just to sort of give a bit of context, that is a service that supports people with persistent pain primarily and then also supports people with uh, persistent fatigue and also weight management. Let me put Powys into geographical context. It's the biggest county in Wales. I believe so, yes. Yeah. So I think, you know, from... As somewhere as high as Welsh Pool Machantleth uh, in the north, then you've got all the way down to Estragunlais. So, you know, you are talking almost like a sort of like a two hour window of driving. We know that in Powys, 
anyone that comes to see someone on a face-to-face appointment it's an average of about a 40 minute commitment for that person so where we can we will go digital first for that person as we recognize it can be easier for them and you know and we're obviously able to help more people across that time as well so it's mid wales not in the industrial areas up to the borders of england and up to north wales almost. yeah it's a huge variation of borders and as i say bordering across multiple health boards multiple areas england and wales so it's a long drive for anybody who wants to see you so digital is important to you Digital is important. As I said, we are making sure we come to people as able as well. So we are developing and we have developed uh, successful contact clinics in key areas, uh, New- uh, Newtown, Estragon Lice for ourselves um, and, and in Bruntley's uh, where we are. Um, but yeah, digital is essential for people. Because if you think about it as well, when we're living with persistent pain, uh, the discomfort associated with uh, long driving, the energy taken to commit to an appointment like that means that hopefully people can have a, a better quality time with us during that conversation and during that physical assessment as we can do digitally if we need to. You know, we talk about rural powers, so although we have a fantastic fantastic digital team, if there was someone sat somewhere with really poor digital access, we can arrange that maybe they can have that support from um, iPad loan, have the right network put in place with the right apps, they're ready to go for them. They can come to their local library or, or other local buildings, so they've got somewhere safe to have that appointment if it's different to where they would be at home. So you say it could be online resources they look at in their own time or it could be a programme that they join in a virtual setting with other people across Powys. So they're able to not only learn, hopefully, some of the hints and tips from us, but also learn from each other because you know, they're the experts, they're the people living with long-term persistent pain. We can show our empathy of that awareness of what we are as clinicians, but actually you can't beat that conversation of learning off each other of what, you know, what works well and what doesn't work as well. What do these updated Wales persistent pain guidelines mean for patients? I really hope for the people that we're seeing, they recognise that there are multiple choices. It's not just about traditional or previous medical modelled uh, interventions where you know, maybe there's a perception maybe that we would have medication as a, as a primary treatment or other interventions, that the people are aware that the menu is actually quite vast and that people want to improve their physical health, uh, psychological well-being as well because it's extremely distressful to be living with persistent pain. Uh, There's multiple options there for them and hopefully by people having access to this new document uh, they feel able to be armed with the knowledge I guess that they can access multiple services and what you're seeing across health boards you know from Howardar to Betsy is that you've got uh, Betsy Kedwalada sorry all the way up is that you've got a, a variation of those services all going following hopefully the core principles of these documents but the variation is probably more to make sure that it's fitting with the people and the areas that they live in. Now, the aims set out in this document very much align with our national strategies for a healthier Wales, the Welsh Government's programme for government, and the principles set out in the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act by putting a focus on prevention and helping people to stay, stay active and independent, and really importantly, empowering people to do more to manage their own conditions. And I'd like to use this time to draw out some of the key things of the guidance. So there are five key parts of that. First of all, the central role of co-production. What is key is to encourage a conversation between people and healthcare professionals using a biopsychosocial approach that considers the whole person, not just the medical issues. So it's important for us that people feel listened to. And this approach shifts the focus to what matters most to the individual, their everyday tasks and concerns, and helps to set reasonable and achievable goals. My name is Sophie. I am the Education Programmes for Patients Project Coordinator within Cardiff and Vale University Health Board. Now, the Education Programme for Patients, EPP... Cymru. Cymru, Mm -hmm. which is Wales. It is, yeah that used to be known as the Expert Patient Programme. That's exactly true, yes. And I went on an Expert Patient Programme 12 years ago and I found it absolutely fantastic. No healthcare professionals helping me and other people to live with long-term conditions. I think that sums up this part of the podcast. (laughs) 
I think you've done it. Yes, I'd just like to reiterate that is exactly it, really. And like you, I attended a course maybe about 13 years ago now. And part of the reason as to why I attended was I live with a mental health condition. And part of my recovery was medication and the CMHT, which is the community mental health team. And at the time, I had a, a community psychiatric nurse that was helping me sort of manage my condition in the community. And at the end of that course of clinical intervention, there really wasn't much else apart from I found out about the expert patient programme. And I remember thinking, what's this self-management? And for me, when I attended, I thought it was all going to be about my condition until I realised that actually there were people living with a range of health conditions on this course, from Parkinson's to depression to what then was we, we knew as sort of ME or was then described as chronic fatigue. We know a lot more now, but there was an awful lot of health conditions and I didn't realise at the time that the Education Programmes for Patients was actually an evidence-based, research-based self-management programme that was designed to help, as you said, support people to live more effectively while managing long-term health conditions that we now know have no cure. And that accepting that self-management is part of the process of living some form of life after your diagnosis is really integral to managing in the communities, which is where we get the most reward and is the most nourishing around our loved ones, in our workplaces, contributing to friendships, to relationships. But without self-management, I wouldn't be able to do those things as effectively now. Those words, self-management, they have to be explained, really. It's not a cop-out. Go away and look after yourself. It's supported self-management, helping you to live with your condition. I didn't think I needed help to learn how to do that, but I clearly did. And that's really key, actually. Yes, it is supported. And what was interesting was that the courses, all of our courses, are ideally facilitated by volunteers who live with health conditions themselves. So as you rightly said, there's not a clinician in sight. So it is people who have accessed the course that clearly feel it has helped them wanting to give something back so then they go on the training to be able to facilitate the course usually now with the condition specific that they access the course with and then they have decided that actually I'd like to give something back and I'd like to maybe support another group to live more effectively while managing their health condition and there it goes then group on group we use the term lived experience and peer support but I don't think those words were used it was just people wanting to learn ways to manage coming together and just sharing that experience we now have terms that people can associate with and that is truly lived experience isn't it that you've lived a program it's been beneficial and you want to help support somebody else manage more effectively but it's important to say that it's not just a group of people saying oh I do this I do Mm. that oh yeah have you tried oh that must be terrible Mm. it is a structured Mm. and well researched Mm -hmm. programme the self management tools that we base all of our courses on are from years of evidence based research clinically proven and also fed back through patient experience that these tools have helped them better manage so we've had all of these years we have a handbook that goes alongside our facilitation and that handbook really I mean our our chronic disease our long term health condition generic course is now on the fourth edition so we have grown and we've learnt and we've added and we've adapted and new research has gone in so that we are truly giving up-to-date and relevant information. The patients have access to that for the whole six weeks. So in the course, sometimes we only cover a small portion of an activity, but then they have further reading should they wish to know more. And that's where then the evidence comes from. They can really delve in to the self-management tools they feel are appropriate for them. Oh, we should say you said a six-week course, so that's one day a week for six weeks? Yes, usually on the same day. So our, our sort of model is two-and-a-half-hour sessions, uh, six-weekly, although we just have now devised um, with clinicians and patients a fibromyalgia condition a specific course and that's eight weeks and what that does is it looks very specifically in the first two weeks about the condition fibromyalgia and then we move into those six weeks of self-management techniques to embed those applied self-management tools in relation to that condition so that is an eight-week course but they are usually six weeks and is this just wales 
No education programs for patients is worldwide. You can access EPP Cymru in Canada, you can access it in America, you can access it everywhere. And the good thing about that is that we follow the quality assurance. So every year, all of our tutors are checked. So quality assurance is checked, we're assessed, we're signed off to make sure that the information that we're giving, as you said, is one, appropriate, two, up to date, three correct, and that we as facilitators are doing that well. So it's not just a case of we're taking anybody and everybody just to talk about self management. We are regularly checked to make sure we're doing justice to the, the script. So, how do people get onto one? It's very easy for us, we have very little criteria. If you're living with or affected by somebody living with a long-term health condition, that includes carers. It could even be healthcare professionals that are maybe providing support and maybe their self-management isn't perhaps where they would like it to be. You can literally go online to eppcamry.org and within that, it sits within Public Health Wales, you'll see sort of the maps of where you'd like to access the course, but the courses will be the same whether you access them in an Iron Bevan or Cardiff and Vale. There's one thing I thought at the time when I did mine, you said no healthcare professionals were taking part. I would have liked some healthcare professionals to actually be subjects of the course, mm-hmm. to listen to what is going on. So would I. <laughs> So would I. And actually, the next course that we have running at Cardiff Royal Infirmary, which starts tomorrow, actually, we do have some occupational therapists going to attend. So we are trying to encourage healthcare professionals to access this as a resource that then, as you've said, if they find it beneficial, they can then use that in their signposting options and also maybe understand what it is we do with the education programmes for patients. More power to your elbow. Once again, what's the website? So it's eppcamry.org. And Cymru is spelled C-Y-M-R-U. And it means Wales. It does, it does. So I think self-management is absolutely crucial. Empowering people to take control, to manage their pain by highlighting supported self-management techniques whilst getting professional help when it's needed. And this could include attending persistent pain management programmes, being supported to learn new skills, or attending peer support groups. And I do think that this peer support group approach is something that we really need to investigate and push a, a lot further. Because people going through the same experiences, um, they, they learn from each other uh, in a way that sometimes even professionals can't engage with if they're not going through the same thing they've got they've developed their own techniques that they're willing and able to share and I just think that is a a whole new approach that we need to develop the infrastructure for for these people to meet Uh, even if it's a digital infrastructure it's a, a, a virtual infrastructure I think that that powerful uh, knowing that you're not going through it alone is really, really transformative for the individual. Like the bat, go find your tribe. Go and find your tribe. That needs to be a strap line <laughs> yeah. a bit. Go find your people, go find people, that, and they'll, you know, what you're going through, it'll resonate with them. Yeah. So, uh, are things improving? Is there greater support out there, or are things becoming more challenging? Do you want me to answer as a third um. sector or as an individual? Because I can give you two answers. <laughs> answers you choose. <laughs> yeah. I think for third sector, yes, it is improving. We are delivering and doing a lot more, but I think it's that catch of getting up there, what we're doing and what we're delivering, and having the capacity to scale it up, as the lovely lady here was saying. I think for me as an individual, no, it's not really changing that much because it's not necessarily being filtered back to me. And is that because the demand for support is increasing because more and more people... I think it depends where you live. So there's a still postcode lottery. Yeah, and we know, and that's a frustrating, I think we know there's really great stuff going on out there, but it needs to happen everywhere. And that's the challenging piece of it. It comes back again, scale up, both within the NHS and within the third sector. I'm Mary Cowan. I'm the Head of Nation for Cymru Versus Arthritis. I think for third sector organisations, it opens up opportunities for us. I think a lot of opportunities to work in partnership and to certainly start to give more joined up services for people living in persistent pain. I think we need to break the barriers down. We shouldn't be third sector NHS 
as as physiotherapy, occupational therapy. We should be working together as one team for the best thing for that person living with persistent pain to enable them to live well. One of the things I heard in the discussion was that the third sector organisations are split into specific conditions. Mm, yeah. Would it benefit people with pain if they could work together more? I think certainly working together more is the way forward. There are, you're quite right, there's a lot of organisations that are supporting people living in pain, but also supporting people living with specific conditions. And I think by joining up and pooling our resources, because I think there's fantastic knowledge out there, and I think that can only benefit the patient at the end of the day and the person living with pain. It's always one of those things, isn't it, where you tend to lean into your condition, organisation, but when you're working with pain, that goes right across such a large spectrum. So I think how we can join up our services, but also how we know what other services are out there that we can refer people into, because I'm not able to give, you know, do it all within Wales. And I'm sure others are in the same situation. So what can we be supporting other organisations through signposting as well and guiding people who come to us over to other organisations who might be able to fill a gap that we're not delivering on? So it is really understanding what each of us is doing and how we can do it together and better. I think one of the important things about a conference like this is that healthcare professionals who deal with people with persistent pain, they meet people from the third sex organizations like you what can they learn from you i think what they can learn from us is is actually working differently we're in the luxury of not having to be so complicated i think and you know the more i hear some of the barriers that the nhs are facing of working in a different way but we are there to take that broader picture and I think we've got solutions for working in a different way so co-producing services listening to what the patient and the person living with the condition needs as well and how we can respond to that I think one of the key things that I was hearing today as well is how we get the message out there as to what the third sector does because there's clearly some clinicians in the room that have no idea what we do and what we deliver so conferences like this are super important we can be here to showcase what we do but also have those conversations right how can we work together and it is about working together it's not about us just doing our stuff in the third sector it's how we complement and deliver together because at the end of the day the person living in the condition just wants to have their pain supported and managed my name's Neil. I'm the uh, clinical lead and in-work services lead for Case UK. We are based in Merthyr and we deliver the Access to Work programme across Wales and the southwest of England and we also deliver the in-work service project across Cardiff, Gwent and the Cumtaf area of South East Wales. Our company has been going for six years now and I suppose fundamentally we're in the business of helping people, and I know that sounds that always sounds a little bit trite, doesn't it? But that's the kind of ethos and the morals of our of our company and our culture. What we try and do at all times is put the client or the participant or the patient, call it what you will. There are lots of different phrases, aren't there, at the forefront of everything that we do. So, what do your clients, patients, or whoever, mm-hmm. what do they need help with? All our participants, which is our preferred term, are. In work, we look to ensure that they can maintain that employment, so with support with their physical health needs, mental health needs, general well-being and general quality of life, make sure that every day is a good day and anyone that comes through us, we'd we'd like to think that after they've come through our service, um, there's none of that the Sunday scaries or the the not wanting to go into work anymore you know I don't think anyone goes to work or anyone is paid enough to go into a job that they 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 don't enjoy and that they're not thriving in and we work towards that and now uh, we've got a team of physiotherapists we have counsellors we have vocational rehabilitation consultants who are all variously qualified in health related areas and we work in a bespoke manner I think to make sure that people are really well supported and move above and beyond where they are when they first come to us. So it's 
mental health, it's physical health, mm -hmm. it's, it's well-being. It's a one-stop well-being shop. That's what KCUK are, I think. So these new Welsh pain guidelines mm -hmm. being announced today, I mean, yeah. what do they mean for your clients? We focus on quality of life. I think if you compartmentalise, if you like, so to separate physical distress or emotional distress, I think it's... Um, very much a false dichotomy. Again, what we, what we look at is people's quality of life and anything that contributes to improved quality of life, I think, is, has to be a positive thing for the people that we work for. Do you have illustrations of people who might have come to you and have been enormously helped? There's certainly a rise in people coming to us with fibromyalgia, which often isn't given the credibility that it deserves, but fundamentally these are people who are reporting they're in pain and they're struggling. From a personal perspective, I've worked with a number of participants and while you know, the status of fibromyalgia, obviously there isn't anything in the future looking at a cure, but we've been able to look at the research, we've been able to look at alternative ways of managing things, we've been able to take what is a physical and neurological condition and work on it from perhaps a cognitive behavioural perspective, which, again, it ties into what I was saying previously about it's a false dichotomy. You can't separate the two. Wellness is wellness. Well-being is well-being. Quality of life is quality of life. It's a... And I know the term holistic uh, does to get, tend to get bandied around with some of the less evidence-based ones, but that holistic approach, that whole person approach, I think that's certainly something that we drive on. And anything like this that seems to be running in the same direction, well, you know, case UK behind it, 100%. Well, I can speak as an expert myself because I okay. have fibromyalgia. So okay. if I came to you in case UK, mm -hmm. what would the process be? So you would come on to one of our services. So, for example, if you wish to come on to our... Able Futures Access to Work program, you would be allocated a vocational rehabilitation consultant who would sit down with you face-to-face -face or by teams, however you prefer it, obviously, change your world, or over the phone, and perform sort of a biopsychosocial assessment. And that's a very fancy way of saying I'd speak to you and say, what's going on? What's happening? What can I help you with? You know, what, what, what do you need? What do you want me to do? And we would get a little bit of an action plan together. And a lot of what comes through from people in similar situations to yourself is things. My, perhaps my GP isn't taking me as seriously as they might. That's quite common. I've got to be honest with that. Work isn't taking me as seriously as they might. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ignorance, I would imagine. We try and dispel that ignorance, but what we would also help you to realise is that you're not alone in this. You say, you've got us, you've got me, your vocational rehabilitation consultant, or we can find you some referral pathways, we can find you some treatments through physiotherapy, perhaps through counselling, perhaps through life coaching, perhaps through whatever it is you might find that's missing in your life. Perhaps your employer isn't particularly well aware of the situation. In that case, we can deliver some training. And I suppose, from my perspective, as a as a practitioner, as a vocational rehabilitation consultant, what I would be saying to you is, you're not alone, you've got me, but also, have you thought of finding your tribe? Because lots of people don't. Have you thought of finding the people who your condition resonates with and who understand some of the things that you've been through and some of the things that they're going through and give you that different take? I don't know if this resonates with you. It really does. It Good. sounds like almost a mediator in the middle of everything mm. who will listen to you and help you through some of the gates that may be closed to you. Exactly, yeah. Some of the barriers, some of the barriers that are thrown up with any condition like, from a personal perspective, I'm a migraine sufferer. Everybody knows what migraine is, but some people say, oh, surely, it's, surely it's just a headache. Well, well, no. And So I could kind of empathise with that frustration and from the perspective of the colleagues that work for us as well, probably more than 75% of us have experienced similar things to the people that we're working for and I think that makes a real, real difference when you're trying to support people. So it's Case UK. Case UK Limited. And the website? It's www.case-uk.co.uk. Anyone that needs support, get on the website, give us a ring. We're there to help. I suppose our tagline would be um, if what you need is a solution, not a waiting list. Communicating without judgment is essential as well. Raising awareness that using certain phrases and language to describe the cause of people's pain may be unhelpful or misleading to a person if it's not 
clearly explained. We often overcomplicate things, don't we, in relation to health. And people come out uh, from surgeries or from uh, healthcare settings and they haven't got a clue what you've been talking about. Uh, and we really need to make sure we simplify our language to make sure that we're communicating in a helpful way. My name's Bethany Davis. I'm a healthcare support worker for the pain team in an Iron Bevan University Health Board. I work alongside Dr. Jeffs with clinics and I also work alongside our chronic pain nurses, just offering support and patient liaison, really. So what does that involve? It's the simple things like booking patients in and things like that, but it's also just helping them ease into into clinic, trying to help with their anxieties that they may have, they act as a chaperone for examinations and things like that. But we've also been working on some new leaflets, some new patient information leaflets, including one about sleep and updating our TENS machine information, just so it's simpler for our patients to understand sometimes I think medical jargon just adds to the stress so if I think if we can make it a little bit easier for them it does seem to take away some of their anxiety I've noticed. Is it rewarding? Very very rewarding yeah you can see a difference in patients just from having a conversation you can just notice that their anxiety and and their stress and their worries seem to just decrease a little bit and sometimes it's a very emotional job when you hear patient stories and and what pain can actually do to somebody. So I used to work in A&E before, so I would always see the beginning of the story, but working with the pain team now, you see the end and you see what actually persistent pain can do to a person. So I've become very passionate about it. These persistent pain guidelines, the Mm -hmm. Wales Persistent Pain Devised Guidelines, what do you think they'll mean to patients and to you? I just think it's just going to be able to maybe open up a conversation, just allow that bridge between the patients and clinicians and healthcare. And I think it's just going to make it a little bit easier to understand (laughs) and easier to access the help that they need and that they've been waiting for. Because unfortunately, it is a long process. But I like to think that we're now on the step to making things easier for our patients. And events like this in Cardiff today they actually bring persistent pain into the limelight. Exactly, yeah. I found working in the pain team that we're, we're not shouting about ourselves enough and, and it's something that I'm hoping to bring into our little team and hopefully we can spread that across. But no, I don't think pain is spoken about enough. I don't think it's acknowledged as much as others. So yeah, I think things like this are really important because we need to get that conversation started. So what strengths do service <laughs> managers bring to the MDT? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we ask the right questions as well because we're not um, profession specific. Yeah. yeah. We ask the right questions. I'm I ask the you know, not the stupid questions, but the obvious questions. So I think that as well. We 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 ask what needs to be asked and we lots of whys, you know, five whys. But there's probably the same questions that we in Welsh Government and, and the management at, the, at that level want to know. We want to know the holistic view of it yes, rather than we inject X amount of people per year and everyone seems happy. It's like, well, We also need to reduce ineffective treatments. Now, if we follow the principles of prudent and value-based health care, we can reduce ineffective treatments and focus on improving a person's functions. And, and what's important is, is that we're helping people with their pain management, but it's not always about the kind of interventions, the medical uh, and, and pharmaceutical interventions. There are other ways of doing it as well, and, and not to over-prescribe is, is also crucial. So my name's Catherine, I'm here from Health Education and Improvement Wales. I'm here with my colleagues from AWTTC and we're here promoting a resource that we've pulled together with the clinical leads um, on analgesic stewardship and pain management. It's a resource uh, web landing page intended for healthcare professionals. So it's got some webinars, links to all the guidance and some useful websites on there that we hope healthcare professionals from across a range of roles and sectors will find useful. How will the patient benefit from this? In the same way as, you know, 
So they'll benefit indirectly because this is intended for healthcare professional use. Obviously, by educating and uh, ensuring our healthcare professionals out there have the accurate information and consistency um, across the key messages in the guidance. Um, they'll ultimately then be able to benefit their patients. How do healthcare professionals get in touch with you or get involved in this project? So we've been um, letting healthcare professionals across uh, Wales know about this resource through our networks at Health Education and Improvement Wales. It's been on our social media, um, but they can find it on the HEIW website um, under support and awareness campaigns. There is a page specifically on analgesic stewardship and pain management resources on there. And finally, we need to upskill our workforce by providing advice on continued professional education, on persistent pain, to ensure we build a multidisciplinary workforce and truly integrated health and social services. So yesterday marked World Patient Safety Day, and this year the World Health Organization have chosen the theme Engaging Patients for Patient Safety. The citizen voice is key to ensure our services reflect the needs of those that rely on them. My name is Stephen Allen. I'm the regional director for Slice for Cardinal Vera de Morgan. Slice is the new Citizens Voice Body for Wales to replace community health councils prior to April. Our role really is to be the voice of the patient, be the voice of the citizen across health and social care services when they're using those services about their experience, what's important to them that they want to feed back both to local authorities and also the NHS. So what do these new guidelines, these persistent pain guidelines, mean for, for your clients? I was listening to some of the conversations on, on one or two tables I could hear, and it was very much the patient doesn't understand what they're being told, the patient doesn't understand what we're saying clinically to them, the patient doesn't understand that. Well, I would turn that back on and say, well, actually, have you given the opportunity for the patient, one, to ask you the questions of what you mean clinically, secondly... Um, have you said to the patient, look, go away with this information? Because there's a consultation, you're only taking about maybe 10% of what you hear. You then go away and think about that. So do you get an opportunity for the patient to come back and say, what did you mean by that? What do you mean by that? How often are patients given an opportunity to go back to the person who's given them whatever news that is to actually say, what did you mean by that? <laughs> And what does this mean? Because only afterwards, when you go away, how, how, how often have we been to see our own GP and the GP's giving you some advice? You've gone away and you think, did, now, did Tim take the blue tablet or the white tablet? You're not given an opportunity to go back and check. So I would say, from a persistent pain point of view, is how are they going to do a sense check that actually the patients are getting a better service because of this guidance being issued? We always have to test the NHS and local authorities because the whole ethos of the NHS is patients at the centre of the services. But actually, for them to be in the centre of the service, they need to help to shape it, design it, and actually assist with bringing it forward and actually being that voice of their community, being the voice within that particular clinical field, bringing that to the table. And I didn't pick that up from some of the conversations I heard today. I'm a patient with persistent pain. Yeah. What I feel about coming to a conference like this yeah. is... Do patients like me actually know that people are talking about them from different disciplines, that they actually, something is being done rather than GP doctor writing script? I would agree with you totally, because I don't think patients do know. The public don't know this is going on today. I'm quite sure if this was open up to the, to the public to volunteer to come in and join, those with persistent pain or those who have experience of persistent pain, maybe carers, for example, it would help them to understand what's actually coming down the line, what they could expect from their clinician when they speak to them, if this guidance is, uh, is being sort of enacted. So those are the things, it's, it's having that communication with the wider community, the wider public, to say, actually, we're having a discussion about this, would you like to be part of that discussion to help us take it forward and actually make this a living document rather than a document that's put on a shelf somewhere and gathers dust? So... What we have to see is this being lived and enacted at every contact made. And not, as you say, the GP just writing a script for sort of a pain relief. While that's important, perhaps, in some cases, we need to live this document. And like any strategy that comes out or any document that comes out, it has to be based on lived experience. I'm pleased to say that along with launching this document, we're working to develop a people's panel for persistent pain. And it's our intention to engage with people who are affected by persistent pain, both directly or indirectly, 
to make sure their voices are heard and are a part of our future planning. I'm Dr Sue Jeffs. I'm a consultant in pain management, um, but I'm also one of the national clinical leads for persistent pain in Wales, working with Welsh Government. I covered the 2019 document. And of course, as you say, COVID mm-hmm. has changed everything in the world. I mean, what are the real changes now? I think the real changes is how we talk to our patient group. Where we used to always drag patients to clinic and then them sit in a car and then they get stiff and sore from sitting in a car, we're sort of trying to think more about what's right for the individual. And that's reflected in the document. Again, it's about where appropriate doing virtual telephone, not necessarily bringing patients in. But I also think it's that self-management, trying to get that balance between what can we do as a healthcare support system, but also what can the person with pain do, and trying to make those two marry a little bit more than they did before, so that co-production shared decision making so it's bringing the patient into the team definitely they are part of and they're an expert they're an expert in their own pain we forget that sometimes and so it's about that listening it's about having the patients know what they want they felt their pain they've lived their pain that pain experience and that's what we should be working with is that that experience so yes you're right they're part of the mgt team so at the end of this living well with persistent pain in wales conference Mm -hmm. how confident are you that on monday morning people will feel brighter about the future i'm hoping that we've had so many different people in the room i'm hoping that will drive discussion changes are going to happen overnight we know that but i think if we can start those conversations Owen and I have got lots of ideas and thoughts as to where we want to go moving forward. Some of that's around education, education for healthcare professionals of all groups, not just the medics, but we're talking about all of the other groups. Working with patients, so we've got our people's panel being developed to try and get that patient voice to understand what they want and what their barriers are to coming to us, but also us perhaps going back to those people living with pain to understand what we can do to support them. So it's that two-way conversation. So I'm hoping that in a year's time, we will be further down the line. It might not be next week, but we've got lots to work on to make that difference, hopefully, in a year's time. That's Dr Sue Jeffs, one of the national clinical leads for persistent pain in Wales. As in every edition of Airing Pain, I'd like to remind you of the small print, that whilst we in Pain Concern believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate and sound based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. They're the only people who know you and your circumstances and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. Now, it's important for us at Pain Concern to have your feedback on these podcasts so that we know that what we're doing is relevant and useful to know what we're doing well, or maybe not so well. So do please leave your comments or ratings on whichever platform you're listening to this on, or the Pain Concern website, which is painconcern.org.uk. That'll help us develop and plan future editions of Airing Pain. And of course, there's more information, including links to all the organisations featured in this edition of Airing Pain at the Pain Concern website. While raising the patient voice to delegates at this important Living Well with Persistent Pain in Wales conference was Pain Concern's Heather Wallace. Here are her thoughts on the day before Wales's Minister for Health and Social Security, Elinid Morgan's final remarks. My impression is it's very, very buzzy. I'm delighted the conference is going ahead. I'm delighted to be asked to present the patient voice. I think we all resonate with the messages collaboration, empowerment, helping people function and achieve their potential and their goals, personal choice. But uh, there's a huge challenge at the end of this conference on how we actually roll this out to the benefit of the population in Wales, which is what we must do. But it's a terrific event, a great document, and I have to congratulate everybody, including the Welsh Government and the Welsh Health Minister, for all the work they've put in. My ask of you today 
is to truly take a person-centred approach to working with those who experience persistent pain. To see people not just as patients, but to recognise the whole person behind the symptom, to listen, to have compassion, to communicate clearly and without judgment, and to provide options in place of directives. Please help us to help them to focus on self-management, to improve function rather than just pain relief, to adapt as challenges arise, and to engage meaningfully with each individual as the expert in their own life. By working collaboratively, providing holistic care and empowering individuals, their loved ones and their employers, I know we can greatly improve the quality of life of those people living with persistent pain. We should deal from Varianchi am Randog Basinauchi, Moin Hai, Gwerthish, Adirnod. I want to thank you for your continued commitment to this cause. You are already transforming people's lives, and I do hope that in launching this refreshed document, we will be able to go further. We will be able to help more people uh, who are struggling uh, and uh, who need our support. Thank you.